Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. I'm breathing the ready the ready juice. Do you breathe juice? You don't breathe juice. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make any that's, sense. Uh, that's very abyss of you. <laughs> I'm putting on the ready helmet to suck in the ready juice. <laughs> I'm going to take a dive in the ready yeah. sea. That's right. What do you What do you listen to over there? Uh, I'm watching. I'm watching the small apartments trailer again. <laughs> It's, I, can't, it's, I can't get enough of it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really good. It freaks me out 
just as much as I uh, enjoy it, I'm afraid of it. <laughs> oh, man. It seriously is, looks like just the strangest <laughs> movie. <laughs> Are we doing trailers already? Is that what we've jumped into? I just, I, yeah. I couldn't. We're doing it. Let's do your trailer and then we'll take a break and okay. do other things. Yes. So your trailer is Small it's, Apartments. It's Small Apartments. Uh, yeah. It's a, a little, uh, it's a South by Southwest film from last year that's opening a very limited release in February and on DVD. Uh, it'll come out on DVD uh, pretty quickly in February here. But it's directed by uh, Jonas Ackerlund or Jonas. Jonas Ackerlund. Uh, uh, there you go. And uh, uh, it looks just wacky. It looks so strange. I don't even know what to to make of it. But uh, yeah, I'm curious. I could you, could you give uh, from from the trailer? Could you give a little uh, synopsis of it? You know, I guess I could. It's it's a man who lives in an apartment uh, where he accidentally kills his landlord, and it looks like they're investigating the crime of because he makes it look like a suicide, and then it's just him trying to escape the detectives. Uh, random freaky neighbors, his wacky brother. You know, it's just a, I, I have a hard time fully understanding it. Uh, it's based on a novel, I guess, Chris Millis's novel. Yes. Uh, who also wrote the screenplay. He, it's interesting. He wrote the book. He actually, it was an award winning book uh, in 2000 uh, as part of the Canadian three day novel contest. So if that gives you any idea, it was based on a book that was written in three days. <laughs> And that, that's that's like, kind of what it kind of what it feels uh, like, it, 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 except that it has yeah, just whacked out. Yeah, it's a comedy crime story. Uh, it star stars um, uh, I don't what's the guy's name? Uh, Matt Lucas. He was uh, <laughs> best known as the creepy roommate brother in Bridesmaids. Uh, he played Gil, the uh, the uh, male roommate that um, uh, had the sister, played by um, Rebel Wilson, who's also in this film. And uh, yeah, let me tell you, Rebel Wilson, I cannot get enough of her humor. She she, she is funny. She reminds me a lot. She's like a female version of Chris Farley, is what she reminds me of. Yeah, yeah. She really has that kind of that comedy, that just sensibility yeah. and everything. But yeah, uh, they're in it. Juno Temple, Billy Crystal, Dolph Lundgren makes in his appearance. <laughs> it's like uh, a motivational speaker. Yeah, it totally like. looks like Patrick Swayze's appearance in... Uh, um, oh, I'm blanking on the, the... What's the movie? God, I'm just... My brain is not with it today. Um, you know, the one that uh, he was in, the uh, Dar Donnie Darko. There it is. Oh, Yes. Um, it, <laughs> this is Dolph Lundgren's turn is that sort of role. Uh, James Caan, Peter Stormare, Johnny Knoxville <laughs> playing Tommy Balls. <laughs> <laughs> also known as Johnny Knoxville. <laughs> Just can't wait. So, uh, it looks, uh, it looks great. Saffron Burroughs, Amanda Plummer. Rosie Perez. Is Rosie it? Perez. Uh, I'm very it excited about it. It's going to be a really interesting film. I'm very much looking forward to seeing the crazy antics that go on in this one. I'm very excited. Because if it's anything like the trailer, I mean, this is a guy who plays, I don't even know what that instrument is. What do you call that thing? The, that, giant, like, the giant elephant tusk used as a horn? Yeah, that's right. The thing that, a, you know, a, a, a Swedish goat herder on a mountaintop uses. <laughs> yes. I don't even know what they would use it for, calling their goats? I <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes, I'm sure that it's a goat calling kind of a thing. Goats, I, I think, are known to respond to long, low wails. <laughs> I'm not sure if you knew that. I, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm not surprised that uh, you knew that. Yeah, I'm quite experienced in goat her, 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 herdology. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yes. Uh, welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, it's, we're doing things out of order, but I think, uh, I think we should, uh, let's see. Uh, so welcome to the show. This is the next reel. We spoil movies terribly. <laughs> and tonight is no exception. Oh, and tonight is, it is, a, it, it may actually be an exceptional exception because it is so current. Uh, unless you've seen it twice already. <laughs> like, like half the people here. <laughs> 
Uh, so we are, we are, it is, I usually don't feel a lot of guilt or remorse about spoiling a movie that's 60 years old, but, but, uh, you should know going in, we're doing Zero Dark Thirty tonight, uh, the final in our current uh, run of Catherine A. Bigelow films. <laughs> he says, implying incorrectly that we'll be going back to early Catherine Bigelow films for any reason whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, that we are doing Zero Dark Thirty tonight, and uh, so if you haven't seen the movie and you don't want to be spoiled, shelve this podcast, turn it off now, back away from your computer or your uh, your mobile device, slowly but deliberately. Don't lose eye contact, or because it can sense your fear, and come back to it after you've seen the movie. That's what we're asking you to do. But not yet. Wait until Pete talks about his trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But first, find us on the website at thenextreel.com or uh, facebook.com slash thenextreel. You can like us to receive updates on, uh, and we post uh, all, all the time over there. We post links to news stories and, and trailers that we like and all that kind of stuff. You can also catch all the, uh, you can catch the trailers that we discuss on the film in addition to the rest of our weekly trailer dump uh, on the website, uh, thenextreel.com slash blog. And we highly, strongly encourage you to give us a call at 657-201-7335, 657-201-REAL, the heart of Anaheim, and leave us a message, and we might just play it on the air. Uh, you can also write us at the show at thenextreel.com. Look at all the great ways you can get a hold of us. Uh, and uh, obviously, you can find us on the Twitter at Soda Creek Film for Andy and at Pete Wright for me. And uh, as always, if you're listening to the show on iTunes, which we know most of you already are, uh, if you're listening to the show on the website or Facebook, we sure appreciate it if you head over to iTunes and leave us a, a, a nice five-star review and a comment. We sure appreciate those. And they absolutely help other people to discover the show. Uh, Definitely. I think that's it. Did I catch everything? You caught absolutely everything. I love it. All right. Now my trailer. Can we do my trailer? I cannot wait. I, I actually, I'm a little scared of your trailer. But no, honestly, but I'm I'm torn because I've got I've got the two trailers that I wanted to talk about. One of them, they both are novel. Mm. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna do yeah. I'm gonna do the more novel of the two. I will suggest strongly that you uh, go to the nextreel.com slash blog and catch the trailer of Girls Against Boys because <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to talk about uh, The Power of Few, uh, the film that is uh, coming, The Power of Few. Uh, it is a film uh, by uh, writer-director Leon, Leone Marucci. Uh, Leone Marucci is an American filmmaker and, and probably doesn't say his own name with, with that kind of an accent. Uh, but the, yeah, the but, reason... But does, but does Jonas Acker... <laughs> Jonas Ackerlund... <laughs> Uh, I, uh, our apologies go out to yeah. both Jonas and to uh, Leon. Leon de Marucci. Their names just <laughs> beg it. They beg for it. Uh, so uh, the power of you, I think, is interesting. I I found the trailer. Uh, I I enjoyed the trailer. I, I like the trailer. I'm interested in the film for other reasons. However, this film. Are you familiar with this film? Do you, do you know about the uh, the genesis of this film, Andrew? I do not know about the genesis of this film. Uh, uh, please tell me more. In in 2006. Uh, uh, Leon de Marucci and uh, his producing partner uh, Corianca Kilcher there's an apostrophe like right in the middle of, of Corianca's name uh, <laughs> and so who knows how I'm doing that uh, they uh, started this project thepowerfew.com uh, where they posted footage from the film over the course of three years uh, and Kilcher had written a um, an online editing tool or at least had had uh, uh, published an online editing tool and they would put up uh you know dailies and people would edit the film so literally tens of thousands of people i i think at this point have uh actually participated in the editing and production of this film uh the power huh. of few um and so they took uh, all of those kind of suggestions and clips and snippets and they put them together in this final film so there are a lot of people uh who are eagerly looking forward to uh the release of this film to see kind of if their their handiwork made it into uh into the movie um it it's uh it looks like an interesting film uh, it stars Christopher Walken Christian Slater uh Kilcher uh, Anthony Anderson Jesse Bradford and my the actress with possibly my favorite name uh in Hollywood <laughs> working right now Moon Bloodgood <laughs> uh, Nikki Whalen, uh, Devin Gearhart, uh, Juvenile, and more. Uh, it looks like a really interesting, 
film, online casting, online editing, and a uh, and a global audience. It's amazing at, at for it a together. film with that sort of uh, type of filmmaking yeah. that it got the cast that it did. I, I that's the thing that that sticks out to me as well. The fact that that you know, in particular, Christopher Walken and Christian Slater are um, uh, are in this film and. Um, you know, it. I I don't know what that says about it either. They just, you know, they made a horrible mistake and they signed a contract. Um, well, Christopher Walken is in almost anything he uh, yeah gets offered. He was <laughs> yeah, in right. Balls of Fury after all. So. That's true. <laughs> that's, that's an excellent point. And Christian um, Slater, he's always looking to get hired by anyone. I think. Well, I think you're too hard on these guys these days. <sighs> I lovingly, think the, the thing is, I I, I, I I enjoy both of them. I enjoy both of them and everything they do. I, I think it's unfortunate Christian Slater's uh, television uh, uh, career tends to stutter every time he gets in a series. Because I like that. I mean, I like watching that dude. Uh, same thing with Christopher Walken. Uh, I, I uh, Man, I enjoy watching that dude move on. And he plays a yo, uh, just a complete Yahoo uh, in this film. Apparently, it's the way it's put together, it's a time-bending uh, thing. It's sort of a, a memento kind of a thing. And so... Um, I see, it looks to me kind of like Amores Peros. Yeah. Like one of those like, yeah, yeah, yeah. multiple stories converging due to one incident. I, exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's all about all about the karma. So, mm. yeah, I'm pretty stoked about this one. Yeah. So, That's it'll be inter- interesting. interesting to watch. Um, Leone Marucci. It doesn't have any release date yet that I see, but no, uh, it looks like you unless can... you are in Russia. <laughs> yeah, I see June twenty seventh in Russia, but in Russia, no well, uh, February 9th in Berlin. Okay. Uh, at the uh, EFM Berlin, February 9th at four forty p.m. and February eleventh in Potsdamer Platz. So you if go. you're there, uh, you should you should check out this film. And uh, Leone Marucci will actually uh, apparently I, I believe. He'll be there. Fantastic. So, for our German listeners. Yeah. There you have it. Uh, so that's a, those, so there are two two trailers. I I uh, so we'll post those on the on the thing. You should go you check them out. Uh, what else do you want to talk about? Do you have any other news? You know, do we want to do? Are we? Is it time to acknowledge the big film news of the week? Or are we going to just weave that into our uh, conversation? Let's acknowledge it real quick. You just don't want to pretend like it didn't happen. No, I can't. It, it'll just be sitting there. It'll just it's be. It'll there. be looming over us. The it's big elephant in the room. And the people who know will know, and they'll know. They'll be. They'll either think we're idiots for not acknowledging it, or that that we're trying to institute a cover up. Mm-hmm. It right. could be a cover up. All right, you say it. So the uh, Oscar nominations are out. Everybody. <laughs> Ooh, and, did you feel a cold, uh, cold chill, cold wind just blew, blew through? You, I found, I found a really interesting site. I, actually, it's not a, that interesting. We, it's a site we refer to way all to, the time. Way to, they, way to set it up. <laughs> I know. But they did an interesting little statistic: the Oscar nominees ranked by gross. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know we just can't stop talking about budgets over here. Totally. <laughs> uh, the the okay uh, now this ranks every film that was nominated for an oscar so what do you think is the the film that has uh grossed more than any other oscar nominee in 2012 well i mean i'm uh wow any nominee for any category Oh, oh, any nominee for any category, not yeah. just best picture. Not just best picture. See, I'm I'm going back through uh I'm trying to think of when these things were actually uh released. Uh well, I'll give you a hint. It begins with an A and it ends with Avengers. <laughs> 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 nice. Yeah, it it uh it grossed 1.514 billion dollars globally. Oh man. Yeah, only Skyfall's just behind it and it's uh you know, uh, it did receive a few more nominations than The Avengers, but it's yeah. uh, creeping up 1. Point, uh, it's just at 1 billion. At the uh other end of the list, we have some of the documentaries. In fact, uh, most of the documentaries are at the bottom. I was uh, <laughs> okay, and and close to the bottom, um, which actually shouldn't be surprising. But Zero right. Dark Thirty, no, Zero Dark Thirty <laughs> is actually close to the bottom, and that's yeah, because it it really hasn't been released. It had yet. what did it have? Three <laughs> days of uh, of box office before 
You it, know? Uh, well, before the end of uh, before the end of the year, and let's see what what's the date that they they just did this January tenth. So really, you know, it only had the two theaters through uh, January fourth, and then however many it expanded to, which wasn't many. Wow. So of the actual best picture nominees. Oddly enough, okay, so the Best Picture nominees were Zero Dark Thirty, Beasts of the Southern Wild, Amor, Silver Linings Playbook, Django Unchained, Lincoln, Argo, Les Miserables, and Life of Pi. Of those nine, what do you think has the highest gross uh, globally so far? Wait, say, I need you to do it again. I got distracted by the first one. <laughs> okay. Amor, Beasts of the Southern Wild, Django Unchained, Argo, Les Miserables, Life of Pi, Lincoln, uh, Silver Linings Playbook, and Zero Dark Thirty. And you're asking me gross worldwide? Yeah. I I just pull a number out of my no 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 nether places. No no no. I don't want you to pull a number. Which of those nine films of the Best Picture nominees do you think has made more money globally? Oh, uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Les Miserables. It's it's Life of Pi. Oh, you know, I should have said that. I was kind of surprised. Were you surprised by that? Yeah. Yeah. A little surprised. It's I it's doing really well. It's yeah. almost at 400 million uh, globally, so. Man. Yeah. That's awesome actually. I have a feeling films like Django Unchained which opened, you know, Christmas, Life of Pi opened at Thanksgiving. Yeah, so that's the thing. I'm I'm I, I feel like it's kind of an unfair question. That's it an is. unfair. It's a loaded question, Nelson. It is. You know, I'm I'm full of those. It is. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, it'll be. Let's 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 talk again in May. Yeah. Let's 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 try to remember to talk about let's this. Let's do that. We, you write that down. And then, <laughs> I'm putting it in my mental notebook. Putting it in your good. My mental, my mental Evernote Which notebook. Just proven time and again <laughs> to be so so uh, so valuable. What was that again? So tr <laughs> your trusted system. That's right. Uh, I'm, I, let's see. So generally, how did you feel about the nominees? I mean, did you feel, who do you feel got, uh, hosed the most? I, uh, you know, I was actually pretty pleased with the, uh, best picture nominees. Um, I haven't seen a more, so I can't speak to that one. Uh, I know I've seen, I think I've only seen one or two of Michael Haneke's films, and they're definitely cold films, a little harder to uh, to watch. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I I hear great things about it. I'm looking forward to seeing it one of these days. Um, as far as, like, actual Best Picture nominees, uh, you know, I, I would have liked to see The Impossible in there. I liked that one quite a bit. Or The Master. I think those two... Um, for best picture, I, I would have um, wanted to see some love, um, and you know, for best director, I, I have to say I think Catherine Bigelow really should have been a nominee in there. I really liked um, *Beasts of the Southern Wild*. I'm not sure if if I would have picked Zeitlin as a best director nominee, but um, you know, it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to judge. It's interesting that neither Argo, uh, Ben Affleck's directing for Argo, nor Catherine Bigelow's for this um, were um uh nominated for best director and those are the two uh kind of the political films of the year yeah so uh, telling uh i liked that uh joaquin phoenix got a, a best actor nod for um the master however uh, i am also disappointed that it didn't get uh, nominated for best picture i think that's um that's too bad and i was a little bummed that john hawks didn't get nominated for best actor for the session oh for the sessions yeah terrific uh, let's see, actress, um, also glad that Jennifer Lawrence got nominated for Silver Linings Playbook, uh, for Best Actress. Um, I think it, I, I think in this case, she, she deserves the nomination for playing, uh, sort of her first grown-up role, and it was, uh, she's terrific. I'm not, um, I, I don't know. How do you feel about, uh, Quivanzene Wallace? Uh, you know, I, uh, thought she was fantastic in the film, um, you know, for a nine-year-old, I thought she brought a lot to it. And it's one of those nominations where it, I think it's acknowledging that a nine-year-old brought a lot to the table and and, and was pretty realistic yep. through the entire film. Yeah. Uh, you know, she pretty much knocked me um, for a loop watching watching that film. She did a great job. Um, uh, you know, it's... it's uh, I, I, I'm always wondering, like, when you see a, a kid 
and not to, to to bag on her because I think she did a fantastic job. But when a kid like that uh, is nominated, is it because there's just not as many uh, great options for nominating in that particular year? And I don't know if that's fair to say, but uh, I, you know, trying to think of other people to nominate, I'm trying to think who who else best actress wise would have been mm-hmm. a uh, a fill in. I can't think of any. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I don't know enough about the um, the the. How do they differentiate between what is what is the requirement for supporting actress versus actress? I don't know. It's it's one of those weird things. Um, I don't know if there, it's just if it feels supporting, or honestly, if the filmmakers or the studio decides uh, that's that's how they're going to run you for the festival circuit. Yeah. Like I think um, a Philip Seymour Hoffman probably has as key a role in the master as Joaquin Phoenix and could very well and possibly should have been nominated for best actor. Yeah. I'm not supporting actor and to nominate him for supporting actor. To me, it seemed like a way to just get them both, a, bo- both a better chance to win something. Yep. Yep. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, and, uh, because I know of your, uh, uh, not so secret passion for animated films, uh, are there any here that make you think again, uh, our perennial discussion of, uh, gosh, I wish animated films would be nominated for best feature. Not really this year. I mean, I, I really enjoyed Wreck-It Ralph, I think would probably have been, uh, be my favorite on that list. Secret World of Arietti may be my favorite of the year, but unfortunately because that came out in Japan, I think two years ago yeah it, not it eligible helped. yeah um yeah the foreign films always have kind of a weird uh rule but um you know i don't know there seemed to be a lot of animated films this year and none of them stuck out stood out to me as ones that really uh were just best picture worthy mm. so I, uh, yeah, yeah, I think you're probably right. I deeply enjoyed Brave. I know you and I are split on that, but, um, and, and I'm finding more and more people that are split sort of binary on that film. Like it's, uh, to me, it's, it's absolutely one of the top that they've, that they have released. Um, go watch Brother Bear and then watch Brave. No, I'm not. That's a setup. <laughs> it totally is a setup. Uh, oh, okay. I, uh, yeah. cin- cinematography. I, I, I think we're, we're, we're shooting for Life of Pi, right? It, yeah, I, I mean, it, yeah, Life of Pi. I will say um, Skyfall is possibly the most gorgeous James Bond film I've ever seen. Yeah, easily. The, the fight um, alone in the, uh, the with the silhouettes up in the skyscraper in Shanghai with yes. that jellyfish thing behind them, that alone deserved the nomination. Well, th- I, I was just going to say that's I, I, that has to be why it was nominated. It was a yeah. work, uh, That was a work of art, uh, with, truly, even within the film. And, but then you go from that to the like the bogs the the boggy moors yeah. of scotland and uh you know it, it just was gorgeous was, yeah stunning from beginning to end but it was yeah, james I, bond it, it was james bond but th- does it matter i mean I, i'm just saying i think compare that to life of pi no and, no no and i agree life, and and that's it yeah life of pi definitely is yeah. going to be uh, i think walking away with it yeah but uh or it should be at least and finally uh best director i uh, you know, some people disagree with me, some of my uh, friends and stuff, but I finally saw Lincoln and uh, I could not believe how powerful I, I found that film to be. And not just a powerful um, storytelling, but the uh, the direction and the the really kind of the assured hand that Steven Spielberg had in crafting that story and telling it the way it needed to be told. Um, for me, uh, it's him. I think I think it's uh, got to be a Spielberg year. Hmm. Fascinating. I I this is the this is a year where I don't and I can't I, I'm like you I can't comment on Michael Haneke uh, because I haven't seen him more. But this is a year where uh, of the remaining four films, I wouldn't be disappointed with either of them, and I'm kind of rooting for David O. Russell or Ben Zeitlin. Yeah, I I, I can't imagine. I I think Ben Zeitlin his nomination is his award. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I agree. He's definitely not going to win David or Russell. I, you know, I hear more and more people who are just, who walk out of silver linings playbook as much as I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic film. A lot of people seem to feel, uh, or I I'm, I'm hearing people coming out going, you know, I don't get it. I don't understand why it's getting all this love. That's too bad. That's yeah. too bad. 
they should see it again. Yeah, I loved it. I and thought then, it was a fantastic and, film. And then go watch Brother Bear. Uh, <laughs> have been brave. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, any others that you want to talk about? Editing? You want to talk uh, about editing? I, uh, I mean, you know, Zero Dark Thirty uh, got a nod for editing. We'll yeah. probably talk about uh, uh, Dylan Titchener and uh, William Goldberg. Goldenberg. I we'll we'll probably talk about what, them a little bit. William the, Goldenberg uh, got it there twice. That's nice, right? Argo. You know, you know. I actually, there's one other that I I do want to talk about, mm -hmm. and uh, because it's it's personally important to me is sound mixing. Yeah. Did because Did Andy Nelson get nominated? I got I nominated twice. Oh, <laughs> yay! Late is and Lincoln. Oh, so you've I, been I, so busy. I, you know, between podcasting and sound mixing. <laughs> <laughs> and all the other stuff I have to do over Goodness here. Goodness <laughs> gracious. Yeah. You picked some prize horses this year. Yeah, it's been a busy year. Busy year. Um, oh, are we surprised at all that The Hobbit did not get more, <laughs> more nominations? I, no, I don't know. If we, oh, one other that I, I do want to talk about, a little bit of a disappointment, but um, for best documentary, neither... Um, um, Chasing Ice, the documentary that uh, Jerry uh, was a producer on, mm -hmm. neither that was nominated nor The Imposter, the documentary that I yeah, worked on right. here. Uh, yeah, that came out earlier in the year. So you know, I actually forgot to post. I was going to post the trailer to Chasing Ice because uh, of that massive, unbelievable ice shear uh, that they captured. That is a fantastic, fantastic film. Yeah, I still I haven't, haven't seen The Imposter, but the trailers look great. Yeah, it's it's great. I think it's available for uh it might be yeah. instant on Netflix right now. I'll check it out. Yeah. Uh The Hobbit got visual effects, uh makeup and hairstyle and production design. Oh, I was surprised that um Lincoln didn't get makeup. Oh, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh I that's mean, a I, great I, question. I I felt Daniel Day Lewis, and maybe he just naturally looked more like Lincoln, and maybe it was his performance. But I felt the makeup work on him brought Lincoln to life a lot more than uh, the work on on uh, Anthony Hopkins for Hitchcock. Did you have you seen Hitchcock? I didn't see it. No, I, I, I I didn't either. Is it? I mean, it's one of those that did it come and I just missed it, or is it not in wide release yet? No, it kind of came and went. It didn't get very good reviews, and I think that's it unfortunate. Slipped, slipped away. Yeah. Um. You know, I'm gonna. I'll tell you. I I think that makeup and hairstyling for The Hobbit. I think. Uh, well, I it's hard to hard to say because they get the screener DVDs, right? Do yeah. they still do that? Yep. Or they just get codes. I think I heard something about them getting codes for an Apple distributing them through the iTunes. No, well, thing. based on all my friends, they're still getting DVDs. pictures of their screeners. I, uh, I, I guess they're. <laughs> I loathe your friends. Uh, uh, so I, you know, I'm. I wonder. Um, I, I was thinking about, I, I wonder what the impact is of uh, the multiple um, uh, visual styles of The Hobbit on its nomination cycle this year. Yeah. Cause I wonder how many people were, were tainted by their theater experience in some way. And yeah. and uh, so, interesting. It's possible. All right. Shall we talk about this movie? We've been prattling yes. on about this forever. We sure have. Let's, All right. let's jump into it. All right. So we're talking about Zero Dark Thirty, um, Catherine A. Bigelow's latest film. And when I say latest, I mean latest. Uh, it released, very limited release uh, on uh, just early December. or late December. December 19th, yeah. December 19th for a couple of weeks to get into the uh, Oscar cycle for 2012. And then wider release into uh, Arizona, apparently, <laughs> last weekend. <laughs> And only today in uh, in Portland. So An actual wide release. Yes. Wide release. Uh, okay. What do you think? I think this uh, is a masterpiece. I it's 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 haunting. It's it's fascinating in its kind of clinical procedural story, but it's also has an amazing kind of emotional connection through Maya played by Jessica Chastain, the, the lead CIA person pushing to, uh, to find Osama bin Laden. And it's, um, it's meticulously crafted. It's a story that takes place over nearly 10 years 
yet manages to somehow hit all of the important key points that um, that make up that whole search. And uh, I, I, I I've seen it twice now, and watching it the second time, it just I mean the first time it was just amazing to me the 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 story and the and everything that uh, that happened to lead up to the the big raid on the compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, that uh, led to the finding and, and killing of Osama bin Laden. Um, it was a, it was a fascinating story told, I, I think, brilliantly. And the second time, I really was able to look at the craftsmanship that uh, Catherine Bigelow used in in putting this story together and telling this story and and finding a way to to keep a human connection threaded through this entire story in a way that still is very reminiscent to the Hurt Locker and like we were saying uh, in last week's episode to the character in Drive and uh, that sort of character who is driven by an obsession and, and has this one thing that they do uh, which we see in Maya as she pursues this uh, one thing in her life. Uh, I really was amazed by this film and uh, I feel that it truly is one of the best films of the year. Yeah, yeah, I I think so. <laughs> what is it? I what is it that makes? I mean, I, I, I can you define what may for you? What what is the mark of a masterpiece? When you say this, or this this film is a masterpiece, how does that like give me? What does that compare to? Well, like, I, for comparison's sake. Um, let's look at, um, and uh, well, uh, that's a terrible comparison. I was going to do a very, uh, <laughs> movie 43 hashtag movie. 43. I, no, I was going to pick an Adam Sandler movie because they're complete <laughs> junk, complete junk. That's, that's definitely, you know, not a masterpiece. It's, you know, it, it's a film that can be rewatched, uh, you know, it, time and time again, and there's always going to be another element that you're going to be able to notice. And there's going to be something in there that stands out as yeah. as uh, a, a new thing to connect to or something that that puts a different spin on it and you'll always be able to find those sorts of things um and, and also the craftsmanship and the the attention that somebody puts into it to to give it the detail that it needs to tell the story um accurately and 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 well the trick with a film is knowing uh, not just a film, a, a story is knowing where to cut a scene and, and when to move to the next scene. I think it was Tolstoy who said, it. you know, it's all about uh, the most important element of a story isn't the characters, isn't the plot, it's the transitions. It's knowing when to go from one thing to the next and 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 telling a story that takes place over 10 years. And Mark Bull gets a lot of credit for this too, for, for writing this based on all the interviews that he did with people who were involved, trying to find the elements and the pieces to put into this, this film that runs, you know, two hours and 45 minutes or so in order to make it solid all the way through without slowing down or, or feeling like it's bogged down or going off on tangents that don't get resolved is an an immense task, and I think that they really they did it in a masterful way. It it shows that these are master craftsmen putting a work of art together that depicts this uh, this you know monumental manhunt that happened in the last just in this century since we've uh, since we've been around uh, since two thousand hit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I and I don't want it to come. I don't want my my uh, sort of subdued response to to in any way insinuate that I did not like this movie. I I uh, really uh, I quite enjoyed this film, and uh, I I was very moved by it in places. Uh, <laughs> I was moved in places I uh, I didn't expect uh, to be moved, and I, I'm speaking of sequences of the film. Uh, <laughs> there it i found myself uh i i think it's one of those films that suffers a little bit from the uh general gravity of uh of the subject matter uh that there are uh, some big um uh, sort of big dramatic shoes to fill 
when you're trying to tell the story of, of Osama bin Laden so soon after it occurred. Uh, and, and I think in, in many ways, uh, Catherine Bigelow and Mark Boll uh, uh, acquit themselves really, really well, uh, n- not just in this film, but in this style and approach to storytelling, right? Uh, with, with The Hurt Locker, it was a very similar um, a very similar situation where you're dealing with a story that is is as contemporary as they come, uh, and uh, you know, so they're they're telling stories about people and about uh, you know not just individuals but about uh, roles that are still in operation in this place, right, uh, in time, and you know we're we're still doing crazy things in Pakistan and we're still doing crazy things and uh, in the Middle East and and our our military investment there is still very active and and aware, and I think um, you know I'm. I, I think we uh, we're so experienced in in seeing th- what we see in Zero Dark Thirty on the news every day that um, uh, there's a little bit of context shock when you see it on the big screen for me at least uh, that that it was um, uh, that that connection to reality was in in this film as as clear as I think I've ever experienced. Yeah. In in I think a positive way, um, you know I was I was very moved by uh, by uh, there there wasn't a single performance in here that I thought was um, you know was lacking in any way shape or form. I mean I I felt like you know this they delivered on a very difficult story in a really kind of elegant way. But it's funny because you know there's no uh, apart from the f- the fact that the movie is sort of spoiled by the news, you know. The news spoiled the end of this movie. Uh, we kind of know where it goes. Uh, well, but that's but, like well, saying that's like saying Apollo thirteen was spoiled because we knew that they made it back. Totally spoiled. I didn't know that they totally spoiled that for me. <laughs> uh, but but you know, the, but what you said earlier really is is the point is that I think as a result of the the uh, the general spoilage of the story, uh, you know, this becomes suddenly a character piece. And I, I think that in, in reading some of the reviews after I've uh, you know after I saw the movie I, th- I think there are I think that's what's missing in the reviews that I've read you people get caught up in the torture and we'll, we'll have to talk about that and people get caught up in the reality you know what is it it's the same thing as the hurt locker you know does, did it really happen like this you know is it, this is insane nobody would do X Y Z this you know A B C way uh, but what we what we don't what what isn't discussed in any of those is the story that leads up to Jessica Chastain sitting in the belly alone of a C-130 with a close-up, uh, that close-up on her face, trying desperately to answer, where do you want to go? Yeah. And when she starts crying and the end credits roll, uh, that has become... No matter what I sort of thought I was experiencing in the film itself, while it was happening, kind of washing over me, when when the screen goes black and the credits roll on her tears, I realized that the story it wasn't about what I thought it was about at all. Yeah, that's I I I know I just rambled a lot there, and I apologize for that, but I I think it's it's really very fresh for me right now, and I'm still trying to kind of absorb it, and and um, uh, you know I I found that made the movie a, a vastly more powerful experience than a lot of the, as you say, the sort of artistry and artifice of, of the construction of the film, which was also good. But but I, I think really so much of this comes down to Chastain and what she was able to... Ugh, unbelievably nuanced performance in an unbelievably sort of bullied story. Yeah. So... Yeah, her... Well, it, it, it's fascinating because I think that you get so much about her character that is uh, not said in this film. You get these senses of, you know, a a person who really doesn't have friends, a person who there are signs that she has some sort of a family, but you don't, you don't ever hear about it. Uh, I mean, and I I don't even know if it's, it seems it's probably like she's an aunt to like a sibling's kids or something like that, you know, because there's one point where you see like a little drawing a kid drew hanging on her wall, but that's it. And you know, you don't get these, you don't get these, you know, direct connections in the story. It's just these little hints at, at the fact that there is a person there, but really what we see is this is a person who this is her life. This is what everything, um, 
really is for her. And, you know, she, she says when she's talking to um, Leon Panetta, when they're sitting in the uh, the cafeteria at the CIA headquarters, uh, you know, he said, you know, she, well, you know, she was recruited straight out of high school, which, first of all, that's, you know, Sarmento and I were talking about that. Why that is strange? Is that the sort of person that you want to know? Somebody who's recruited straight out of high school into mm-hmm. the CIA? Like what? What did they do in a high school that led the CIA to draft them? I don't know. But um, but, but you know says, they they you know that's a I, that rang true to me. I mean the CIA was recruiting in our college fairs uh, well, at, in high school. College fairs? No 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 no. Oh, our oh, our I, in when I was a senior, they were at our college fairs in high school. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah. I was picturing like a, you know a sports uh, a sports scout like yeah. scouting where they're just following you and they're, you don't yeah they're them. they're sitting oh, like, oh her Let's sitting her. in the back of your Arabic class <laughs> <Right>. in, in <laughs> college in high school she's, she's the one who yeah, is look. that who is that old man <laughs> in the wide brim hat <laughs> with the micro with me. the microphone. <laughs> Oh, that's just a CIA, CIA scout, honey. The scouts are on campus today. Who's that man dressed as a tree? Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah. But but she says in that meeting, you know, he says, you know, what else have you worked on? She says nothing. This is all I've worked on since I've been here. She she is driven. She is focused. This is it. And I I find that last moment with her. Um, so heartbreaking for a couple reasons. One, because yeah, she doesn't she. She accomplished everything she's been setting out to do since she's been at the CIA, get Osama bin Laden. Yeah. And that's it. And now she just is, it's like, you know, it's like almost like her life has ended. She has no idea what to do with herself anymore. And at the same time, I think it's also a reflection looking back on all of the things that she had to go through in order to get to this point. You know, the yeah. torture, um, seeing her friend get killed, nearly getting killed herself several times, uh, you know, people all around the world getting killed uh, by terrorists, you know, just horrible stuff that that had to go on in order for this moment to happen. That paired with her just being lost, I, I think it's just, it's an amazing moment and it's it's a, a powerful character portrait that that really drives this film all the way through. And when you see that last moment, it really rings true. Like you were saying, what the story is really about here. You, when she is, uh, you know, she's eating lunch at the CIA, right? And um, James Gandolfini has, uh, comes and sits down as, uh, Gandolfini plays uh, Leon Panetta. And uh, he sits down next to her or across from her. And he, you know, he says, how's the food? Uh, well, it's all right. And he says, have, you know, what else have you done for us? since you've worked at the CIA. And she says, uh, you know, you've seen it twice. You probably remember it better than I do. But she says twice, she says, uh, nothing else. I've done nothing else right. than look for bin Laden. And, I, you know, I thought that, the, you know, in, that's one of those cases where I think the delivery and the, the sort of double meaning of that nuanced, uh, sort of her approach to that character and how she, um, you know, how she delivered that line, uh, I, I think ends up really sort of a, a bookend to those final tears, which is, you know, as you say, she spent her, the, the substantive point of her, of her life. She, you know, trained and became an agent. And, uh, now, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's over as a result of the fact that her, you know, her entire career has been devoted to the assassination of this one person. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing, you know, I, I don't know, tell me if it's too early to start talking about this, but I want to talk about the torture stuff. Well, just, um, yeah, I, I want to come back to that last shot at some point. Um, I, I can bring it up now or we can, whatever. Why don't you bring, let, let's, well, the, the only reason I'm bringing up the torture is because of her. And, and I, I think that might be a bigger conversation. You do your thing first. Well, I just, I found it really interesting that last shot of her. And uh, I know that, um, they uh, uh, talked about it on, I think it was uh, on film spotting somewhere else, but um, the interesting composition of that last shot where she is sitting on, in this belly of this cargo plane, there's a white kind of a you know paneling wall behind her with a red uh, canvas net over it. And it's, it's kind of like this red grid behind her with the white under it. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting how it almost looks like kind of a, an American flag in some way. 
and it's very interesting. Although, um, and I, you know, I don't know if this is really has anything to do with it. Uh, anything they were thinking, the filmmakers, there's no blue as far as like the red, white, and blue flag. And, uh, you know, the red, I, I was trying to remember what red, white, and blue represented color wise on our flag. And I found out they actually don't mean anything, but, <laughs> <laughs> but red, white, and blue do mean other things in other, um, things that, you know, people in the government have designed <laughs> since then. And so <laughs> do tell, let's talk about well, okay. some of those things. So, so red, there's a cashmere there's a, ca- a certain cashmere <laughs> claw uh, uh wall no, it's like the seal coating. it's like the presidential seal okay um, you know they're, they're like very presidential or very very devoted um uh people to the country who have whole websites about like the colors and the flags and everything yes. so they they filled me in every one of them <laughs> said the colors on the flags mean nothing <laughs> <laughs> So I, I feel pretty confident that I can I can say that and not be wrong. But they do mean other things in other uh, things like the presidential seal and things like that. And they always are using the same colors, red, white, and blue. Uh, so red represents valor and hardiness, and white is purity and innocence. Um, blue is vigilance, perseverance, and justice. And so it's interesting that justice isn't represented. Valor and hardiness is, you know, this net over the the wall of purity and, purity and innocence, which, you know, I think is kind of interesting. And then she's sitting in front of it and she's crying. And again, I have no idea. One it. one could make an, an argument that because she was crying, she was blue, <laughs> which in this case means melancholia. That's right. I, I I don't know what it is, but uh, all I can say is I see some college kids' uh, paper written about yeah. the colors in the last <laughs> shot of this film one of these days. That's awesome. So there, that's my little thing. I like the, it. That little last little devi- shot. But deviation. It, it, was a, it was a really interesting just composition of that last shot. I really It really stood out to me this last time. So, But anyway, going back to the torture, which you were going to talk about. Well, okay, so the, uh, the film opens... Well, let's talk about the film open first. Uh, so the film opens in 2003 or 2001. Uh, and it, it there is a, uh, I, I'll say, an uh, uncomfortably long sequence of audio only. I think it's um, masterfully done. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just, but yeah, tell me but you you're weren't right. a little bit uncomfortable by the t- as that keeps oh, going. I, I, I uncomfortable in the sense that it's you know it's it's audio of september yeah. 11th and it's uh, of the attacks of 911 calls it's police and- calls it's yeah it's it's uh, it's the the one where she says you know it's uh, it's so hot here i i'm going to die aren't i i'm going to die it's so hot i'm burning up and then the phone goes dead yeah. uh and and i i found I, I was uncomfortable in the sense that they they were putting in my head sitting in the dark uh in a way that was um you know a, incredibly powerfully manipulative uh filmmaking in this case to put me in that frame of of where we were yeah uh in 2001 right but it, but well and i i would say manipulative but not in a way that is um done in a with poor taste or you know i think well that's the it, argument though that is the argument that if we're talking about manipulative it had the the other side of that coin is that she was manipulating us in a way that was a, a little bit ham-handed i don't necessarily feel that way but but i can see how that case could be made yeah i i think it was i it's i mean you know people have likened this film to a police procedural and you know like they've said in order to have a police procedural you need to have the crime yeah. in order to follow it. And in some way or another, September 11th was going to have to be represented right, right. in this film. And it is a very hard thing to listen to and, uh, and remember and think about where yeah. you were and just, I mean, millions of things come flooding back as you, as you're sitting in the dark in the opening of this film. But I, th- I felt it was done. Uh, I, I, for me, I felt it was done in a way that made sense, wasn't overpowering, didn't uh, didn't linger unnecessarily, uh, but also made me. It really reminded me of the horrors that that happened uh, that day, and really put this whole film into context for me. Well, and that is 
uh, I think it really uh, that th- the whole reason I bring that up and the manipulation, uh, you know, and I, I use that term intentionally because uh, in in many respects it's been long enough uh, since the attack itself, since the the World Trade Center itself, that I think we're sort of desensitized by the 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 media surrounding it and by by turning out all the lights and just playing us uh, the sort of horror that that happened surrounding um the attack itself we're put in a place of or at least I'm, you know speaking for myself we're put in a place of of kind of uh residual rage right you, it yeah. it's hard to sit in that in in that and listen to that sequence and not be taken back to that rage that you felt that day in some small part right right and then we are brought to 2003 and my young maya uh is She's uh, moving to uh, Pakistan, and the very first thing she does is she accompanies Dan, the section chief CIA guy, to to this black site uh, for interrogation of Amar. And we see enhanced interrogation techniques at at work. We do do the humiliation, we do the waterboarding, we do the the sleep deprivation, we put the guy in the box, we take his pants down and show his privates to a woman. I mean, it was was everything that we heard is the most offensive and humiliating and uh, the, the, you know, incredible sort of cultural uh, violation uh, that that, that you could possibly do to break these guys down. Yeah. And I think from a, from a film structurally, from a filmmaking kind of perspective, uh, we I think we could not have opened on that sequence without the audio. Do you agree? Well, yeah, it, it, I, there are I people think... who are up in arms about this sequence anyway, right? That it's it suddenly becomes a pro torture film and it's pandering to the administration and whatever. But I think it puts us as an audience, no matter how you feel sort of uh, moved by it, you're enraged already, and suddenly you see a visceral sort of visual reaction to that rage. Right. Yeah. No, it, I think you're you're spot on. It's, you, and that's again, you you needed that context to understand why, and and I don't want to say that torture is right, but why people were doing it or theoretically doing yeah. it or whatever yeah. it is well let's just let's just say for the sake of our podcast why people in the film were doing it yes yeah and i i think that's what's so important about this is that uh, you know we have um you know we've set up that that cultural rage and now we have given us given ourselves that sort of vindication as audience members yeah. right whatever you right. think about it here we are and and it, now uh, we get to deal with sort of the the ethical and moral implications of what we did, right? Right, and uh, you know, I, I found well, first of all, on Jessica Chastain, which is why I originally brought this up, I I found the beginning of the film uh, almost as interesting as the end, where she we got to watch her make that transformation uh, from the uh, more naive kind of uh, young. Uh, intelligence officer going into this i and we are only i'm assuming that this was you know her first uh time in you know she was treated like a novice in one of these interrogations right she originally was wearing the hood you know wearing a a, a face mask but uh, then decided to take it off uh, kind of mimicking dan um and, and yeah i think i think it absolutely was her first time i mean yeah. i think she's brought out to the field and that yeah she's thrown right yeah. into it and, i mean she's still wearing her suit and high heels <laughs> yeah and and we are and so we get to sort of experience that with her it's our first time seeing it as well largely and and so uh you know we watch her kind of hold back her uh, what I'm interpreting as nausea you know at watching this happen and then she takes part in it uh, in even in a small part by by staying in the room when the rest of the team leaves, and uh, uh, you know, and responding to him to the detain to Amar when he says help me please, and she says help yourself by telling the truth. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's her uh, first uh, act of of you know, uh, uh, as as uh, complicit to to this behavior. Yeah, and then you see later after Dan has you know. Uh, gone back to just work in Washington, mm-hmm. you see her running these things and she's totally kind of become the, become the person who's, who's 
used to the torture as a method of right. of gathering information and it no longer even phases her. I found it so interesting watching her just you know she's watching tape after tape, DVD after DVD of all this footage of people being tortured. She's not phased by any of the stuff that's going on. All she cares about is the information coming out of people's mouths. Right. Right. Yeah, I found that really interesting. I think she handled that, you know, you want to say growth or deterioration uh, of, you, you know, as an agent who uses these enhanced techniques, um, it, you know, uh, in the film. Um, I think she she delivered on that in a really sort of um, uh, powerful way. Uh and and uh, you kind of see her lose herself a little bit in uh, well not even just a little bit you see her lose herself in the in the process uh, and her final confrontation uh, with her um, with the station chief with the station chief uh, uh, you know uh, what is it big hearts can't lose jo- Joseph brave, Bradley brave brave hearts big big hearts brave hearts can't lose what is it the Friday Night Lights. Chan- yeah. Kyle Chandler's. Oh, yeah, he's, I don't know. I don't he's know the actor who played. He was the coach yeah. on Friday Night Lights. Come on, what? I, well, I know what you're talking about. I just I've never watched the show. Brave, brave hearts brave, can't lose. Brave hearts, yeah. clear eyes, clear eyes. Brave hearts can't lose. I'm gonna go I with did, that. I didn't like that movie at all, so I never watched the it. It wasn't even a, the show was much better than the movie. I'm sorry, yeah. Peter Berg. I'm I'm sorry. Anyway, he played Joseph Bradley. He played Joseph Bradley, and her final confrontation with with him in the, in the hall, where she, you know, stands up to him, and uh, I think really, you know, you see her unravel, uh, you know, in front of him and in front of the other uh, agents who are sitting in the office immediately behind her, uh, and you you kind of get to get to watch her uh, her final sort of deterioration, which then she picks up as they get closer and closer and she finds this lead. She gets this lead. They, the cell phone chase was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and you, you see her begin to grow and begin to kind of find her strength. And then, you know, well, and, and also um, you didn't mention it, but um, her friend gets killed. Her friend, uh, Jessica played by Jennifer Ely. Um, she is uh, pursuing a different lead yeah. that she thinks is going to uh, give them the lead to Bin Laden, a, a doctor, and uh, she's one of the agents who's killed in the uh, the attack on the on the Chapman compound. I believe. Right, right. And um, yeah, and and uh, immediately Maya after, says, a lot of my friends have died trying to do this. I believe I was spared so that I could finish the job. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, she's. I, I think uh, I, exactly. I think it's absolutely terrific. Now, does the interpretation of this, uh, of her role uh, as complicit in enhanced interrogation in this film, and the use of these techniques in this film, uh, does it? Uh, was it overboard for you? No, I don't think so. I I think, uh, you know, I mean, there's so much going on about the torture, uh, not just the way that torture was depicted in the film, but um, how did they get, or, you know, they can't be portraying this because it didn't really happen. And there's so many stories about it. There's also a lot of people up in arms because um, of the film critic at the, at the guardian who came out, um, you know, uh, bashing the film before he had even seen the movie right. because of because of the way that they were depicting torture and everything. There's there, I mean, there's so much stuff going on about torture in this film, but uh, what I found interesting is Catherine Bigelow when she I believe when uh, it was the um, New York Film Critics um, Circle when she uh, accepted her award for that she said, um, "Depiction is not endorsement." Right. And if it was, no artist could ever portray inhumane practices, no author could ever write about them, and no filmmaker could ever delve into the naughty subjects of our time. Naughty, K-N-O-T-T-Y, not, you know, you've been mm-hmm. bad. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and, and I, I think that's, that is very true. It's like, just because a filmmaker is, or any storyteller is depicting something does not mean that they're endorsing it. It doesn't mean that she's pro-torture. And she's saying the only reason we got Bin Laden is because of this torture and she's become a Bush apologist and all this sort of stuff. I mean, there's so much talk about this going on. I found the the fascinating thing about all of the torture scenes going on in this film is for me, it just was like this 
this horrible insight into what people are willing to do in order to to get information from people and it just it it opened my eyes whether it really happened or not you know because there are people who say it never happened there are people who say it definitely happened i you know in the film it happens and i find that the lengths that people go to and the the loss of humanity people suffer in order to you know solve a crime like stopping bin laden uh it, it's frightening to me frankly it's it's really horrifying that people go to these lengths to to um get answers to things in some cases maybe i mean yes maybe it did help us solve uh, this crime and, and get bin laden in that case maybe it was worth it but you know at what cost how many other people um had to get um hurt not just the people who are getting tortured, but also the psychological destruction that happens on the people doing the torturing. Yeah. I think Dan definitely suffered. You know, he's like, I can't do this anymore. I've seen way too many, you know, naked men or whatever he says. I mean, he says it in a very playful way, but you can tell that torturing people for so long has definitely taken a toll on him. By the end of the film, it's clear that whether Maya is at a loss for what to do with her life now or she's reflecting on everything that that she's had to do to get to this point she is an affected woman yes well it's it's an interesting um it's an interesting point i'm i'm with you and on this one i think even more than the hurt locker you know we talked a lot about the sort of uh the veracity of the hurt locker you know did bowl really capture what was going on there what was ridiculous you know, sort of use of military or, or violation of military protocol for the sake of storytelling and uh you're starting to hear a little bit about that uh before for this movie, but most of it is is around the inter the inclusion of this. Um, the, most of the hubbub is about the inclusion in in of of the interrogation techniques because I you know there are so many people. If it did happen, there are a lot of people who who sort of have their hands in it that are still real people and still in office in in many cases. But the I think David Denby uh, of the New Yorker has has it right when he says uh, this: uh, Do the, do such scenes hurt the movie? Not as art; they are expertly done without flinching from the horror of the acts and without exploitation. But they damage the movie as an alleged authentic account. Bigelow and Bull, the team behind The Hurt Locker, want to claim the authority of fact and the freedom of fiction at the same time. And the contradiction mars an ambitious project. That, I think, is the real sort of contradiction that that we're dealing with in this case. And, and the fact that you already in this conversation have had to say a number of times, uh, you know, did it happen, did it not happen, whatever it happened in the movie, is a sort of, uh, um, uh, uh, what's the word, it's like a, uh, you're having to acknowledge that fact that, that Bigelow and Bull have already said it's part documentary and part fiction, and you can't do both of those things at the same time uh, on a topic such as this. Well, yeah, and that's definitely true. I, Although, see, I, I feel like I don't know how to interpret that because I want to say, you know, I firmly believe Mark Bull did his research, sat with people, and I'm sure he talked to people who who told him about waterboarding and all the, the all the torture that they did. Yeah. You know, I, I'm sure yeah. they talked to people because I, you know, I personally believe that they probably did this sort of stuff. You know, I, I, do, too. I do, too. I don't feel like, you know, it, it, people this, who are this, saying yeah. that they didn't. I, you know, anyway, I don't want to get into this, political. This stuff doesn't doesn't just come out of thin air. This yeah. kind of the specifics that they that it just doesn't come out of thin air. But but the thing that I feel like that when Bigelow and Bull are talking about the the fact versus the fiction, in my head, I'm feeling like they're talking about the fact is the facts of things happening, like the waterboarding, yes. like the the insane amount of detail that they put into making the raid on the compound as close to time accurate as they possibly could. All that sort of stuff is what I see as the fact. The freedom of fiction, for me, when they say that, is is creating this character Maya who they they based on a real character but obviously they had to fictionalize her they had to fictionalize the whole idea of her being this this dogged person because they couldn't really come out and say who this person was they were not allowed to 
um, you know, probably for many, many reasons that right. actually say who this woman was. And so they had to invent a character. In fact, they probably had to invent a number of characters. Well, they did. But see, film. look at the content. Look at the, the, the conflict in the dramatic conflict when or in the, the popular cultural conflict that we have when we have admittedly invented uh, based on true but fictionalized characters in Maya and Dan sitting across from very real characters, Leon Panetta and others uh, like that. That creates uh, a, a an excuse. It's like a it, it's like a license to complain about the f- thing not being real. And and I think that's that's my point. It's unfortunate that that construct exists because I'm with you. I believe that the elements did occur. Now whether they occurred when and where they occurred, uh, whether or not the the Bigelow team had access to you know classified information that they were not supposed to have access to, uh, you know whatever that case, the film ends up portraying things that I you know I personally believe you know happened in some sh- way shape or form um, sure. and uh so anyhow yeah. uh, so let's can we can we talk about the actual uh the actual final scene or do you yeah, want to you want to say more about the other thing no 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 i think i think that's it um, okay going into the the final scene though i i something that really um struck me this time well you you start you you wanted to talk switch so you, what were you going to say about the final scene I was gonna say <laughs> there are there are and no disrespect to our to our military. They're really no disrespect. I was like I was first of all really moved by the the SEAL team, right? That uh, just in general, the the way they carried themselves together as as you know actors and the military on screen. I was uh, really moved by their humor and the intensity and particularly the sensitivity. Uh, you know. Once the 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 guy who had actually shot uh, Bin Laden, you know, realized what he had done, like I, I thought that was a great reaction. But man, yeah. they're not quiet. <laughs> the whole time I'm thinking this is going to be so sneaky, and they have these super stealth, se- sneaky Area 51 helicopters. And what do they do? They practically land on the compound in the middle of the night and then crash one of the helicopters. I know, I know. I, and well, then I all they expect- do is they sneak around on tiptoe and go up to doors and blow them up. They'll never know Execute. we're here. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> It was that. Yeah, it was funny. But I, but I did find it really interesting. And the thing that I found fascinating about it was, and this is what I was about to say before I, I let you uh, <laughs> talk about that. I I, I didn't go where you thought I was going to go. Did you I? You definitely didn't. No. You definitely didn't. I found it really interesting how, and then see here now, I'm getting all serious again. <laughs> 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 yeah, thanks. But it was interesting how um I, I mean I how messy the beginning of the film is. It just like the September eleventh stuff and how how lost it was and how it just it was a mess. It was just you know, nobody knew what was going on, it was chaos. And then you get to the end, and it's interesting how over those 10 years, how refined this search became so that by the time the SEAL Team 6 was in the compound, it was so clinical, so procedural. It was like they had it mapped out. And and the way that they moved, the way that they, they had everything planned, the way that they, they uh, shot somebody, it was all like a, in such a refined way that it was almost like there was nothing... Um, wrong about it like they never took a misstep uh, aside from crashing a helicopter which was, <laughs> was, was uh, quite a misstep but but from then on it's just like non-stop these guys knew exactly every step they needed to take for this raid that they were doing and it's amazing how this chaotic attack on us on september 11th led to this quiet well <laughs> i say quiet <laughs> <laughs> Despite the explosions and gunshots and crashes and, and loud swooping helicopters, but for the most part, when they were moving around, it was very tiptoey, quiet, you know, sneaky, whispering names and stuff like that. Osama, and how? And... Osama. That was great. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, so, I mean, I did, shouldn't have been laughing. Uh, you know, I, w- I want to add, though, there is an interesting, you, you bring up a really interesting point for, for me, that's sort of reflection that, you know, there's sort of this dramatic uh, valley before Act 3, right, where she is, um, Maya is faced with this position. I mean, you, you say that, that uh, you know, over the course of 10 years, everything got sort of refined and clinical uh, and clear, and, and you know... I, my well, interpretation. I'm not, I'm not saying clear. I'm not no. saying clear. I'm saying the way that the, the search, it kept getting narrower and narrower. Yes. So finally, it was this pinpoint mission of preciseness. Well, and that's that's what I, I think is so interesting in that sort of valley before Act Three, right? When we are we're at this point where she's at her lowest, and the reason that it is so refined in many ways is because so many people have fallen off her bandwagon, right? Yeah. And so when we hit Act Three, the real lesson there is just the power of perseverance of an idea. And when she's sitting around the table and all of her so-called followers or, or the people who that are, are so-called supporters say, oh, we're 60 percent positive that that, uh, you know, that's been loud. And it's only 60 percent. And she says 100 percent. OK, 95, because I know certainty freaks you guys out. But it's 100. Yeah. Uh, the only people left in the room uh, at the point when SEAL Team 6 goes on and, and, and is executing these orders are the believers. Yeah. And I think that is a very powerful message in this film. And that that, it, it, you know, really struck me, um, you know, in the way we see uh, kind of the power of an idea climb out of Act Two and into Act Three was was beautiful. Yeah, it was. I also found it fascinating how I mean, she had been, you know, she kept marking on the window how many days it had been since they found the compound. And it was, you know, I think it was close to 120 some yeah. days or something like that by the time they finally uh, went in. But I found it so fascinating that after waiting all those days, I mean, here she is with the SEAL team. They're sitting around playing horseshoes. I mean, there's like nothing going on. Who knows how long they've been out at that at that base waiting to get a, a call mm-hmm. all of a sudden out of nowhere the call comes in and less than 24 hours later she's standing at, looking at a body bag with osama's body in it yes i mean it's amazing that's what i found really fascinating is all this waiting all this just sitting around not doing anything without even realizing it less than 24 hours later your whole thing's done yes yes it, the I mean, power of that acceleration it was it was really well portrayed yeah all right well i got i got that off my chest i feel good about that i need to see this movie again you recommend a, a second viewing I sounds got, sounds like I, you got a lot more out of it i did get a lot more out of it the second time i really um just found a lot more little bits and things something else that i caught the second time was how often she used reflections over the course of the film and i'm not really sure what she was doing or what she was trying to say with her use of reflections but man there are reflections of people in in windows in mirrors in picture frames just all over the place Mm -hmm. and i don't know if it's just because people taking a look at themselves and and trying to you know acknowledge what it is that they're having to do to get this guy that sort of thing i'm not really sure what she's trying to say the most interesting one i found uh the second go around is um i believe it's after she is is trying to get information out of the um i can't remember the guy's name but one of the number two guys that they catch um they they catch that guy and she gets to interrogate him and she's trying to get information trying 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 to get information from him but she's not getting anything out of him and it cuts to her in the bathroom and um and she's she's just you know looking at the sink as she looks at herself in the mirror and it cuts to her looking at it cuts to her reflection but it's from a ways away and it's a series of mirrors down all all these sinks down this long bathroom and it, so her reflection is broken up across all these mirrors. And it's just a, a fascinating reflection of her and how, you know, she's just become almost just like, you know, pieces of a person because she's just so focused on this pursuit. I, I really enjoyed the way that Bigelow incorporated reflections into it. I mean, it's very Spielbergian because Steven Spielberg loves his reflections. Oh, yes. He's always putting reflections in films. And watching it the second time and just see all those reflections it really i mean that's the first thing i thought it was steven spielberg but um yeah it's it's interesting i'd like to watch it again now that i caught it and really kind of pay attention to 
when is she using them and, and what just happened, what is happening, why are they using it, and what's she trying to say. So uh, hmm. it's interesting. A lot of stuff in here that really just shows a, you know, a very smart filmmaker telling a, telling a tough tale. It is a tough tale, and it's. A, I think it's an interesting perspective on um, on war. Uh, you know, I I feel like, it, in in one sense, when when we started killing each other, you know, humans, yeah, for you know, I don't you know, mean it, food, at the beginning of time, <laughs> yeah, 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 right in the beginning. You know, we start killing each other. We start killing each other with our hands, right? You know, and then then suddenly we find a way to, uh, you know, to throw rocks and kill each other by throwing stuff and bows and arrows, and that makes it easier. And then then you know. So arrows and spears and and slingshots and guns and everything that we do to kill each other gets further and further and further away from the sort of the inhumanity of you know killing one another with our hands right of of hurting one another with our hands yeah and uh what you know now we're in this the the era of modern warfare where we are now not only killing each other with you know we're killing each other with robots uh and yet this film is about the modern the era of modern warfare in which we still ask people to do horrible things to one another with their hands and i that i think is now that we've talked about this thing for an hour uh i think that's the context shock i'm trying to really sort of deal with is is that you know she's telling a story that is complicated on so many levels but m- much of it deals you know for me about uh, with this idea that you know uh, of, of what it what how ridiculous it is that we're still killing each other uh, with our hands yeah a- at all I mean killing each other at all but the fact that it re uh, you know what damage does it do you know to us to 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 be involved in this kind of a conflict so yeah 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 it's it's just horrible it's, it is it's, horrible and it, it's 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 a it is a beautiful. Uh, I think it's a beautiful film uh, talking about some really horrible things, um, and uh, yeah. Well, um, Richard Corliss wrote a, a fantastic review of it in Time, and he had a great little line which I, I think defines this. And and in context with the Hurt Locker, he says in the Hurt Locker, Bigelow and Bull viewed the war on terror in a microcosm through the eyes of a trio of bomb diffusers in Iraq. Zero Dark Thirty is a macrocosm. Instead of a Baghdad street where an IED could explode underfoot, my and her colleagues tread a minefield that stretches from Kabul to Times Square. Though it focuses on the determination and resilience of Maya, the film is a giant fresco, an imposing series of surgical strikes set in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Poland, and the U.S. And I, I think he he catches it in in this and puts it on this the scale where it is this macrocosm. You're seeing all of the horror of this war on this huge scale of this manhunt in a way where we're still with Maya and her colleagues, and we're seeing it through their perspective, and we're seeing the killing, and we're seeing we're, it's it's personalizing it, and it, all the way through to the end, it comes through, and it's it is a difficult, beautiful, horrifying film to watch that depicts what war is, what war does, what revenge is. I mean, there's so many things that it's talking about in this film and it's a, it's a fascinating film. It really is. And it's, it opens your eyes to this story, but also what we do and, and how it really doesn't change. Yeah. Oh, heavy. It is a heavy film. It definitely is a heavy film. Are we, uh, are we, uh, are, are we good on this movie? Are we putting this one to bed? Well, I just want more? to say, <laughs> <laughs> do we have more? Oh, Pete. Um, of course, there's always more. Um, <laughs> so, I'll, so a lot of her team came back from the last one. Surprisingly, I actually was quite surprised to see that um, her DP, um, Barry uh, 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 Ackroyd, didn't come back as the DP this time. It was, it was uh, Grieg Frazier was the cinematographer on this film. And I, I, I didn't hear anything as to what happened. If there was some, some reason that she changed DPs. Cause I thought the cinematography on the hurt locker was fantastic. I really enjoyed what, uh, Barry, uh, Aykroyd brought to the table. Uh, but Greg Frazier or Greg, however you say his name, he's Australian. Um, he's, and he's recently been quite a busy boy killing them softly. Snow White and the, Snow Hunts- White and the Huntsman. Yeah. 
yeah, um, let me in. He's been doing a lot of stuff. So he came on board to shoot this one. And, you know, I thought he did a, a great job. It was a, a, you know, a very kind of just well made film. The whole thing I thought looked really good from beginning to end. And then her editing team was the same. Um, she brought her same editors back who did get an Oscar nomination, William Goldberg and Dylan Titchener. So uh, kudos to them. But Alexandre Desplat was the composer on this film. Uh, which was a change from last time with Marco Beltrami and Buck Sanders. This time uh, she brought Desplat in to do it. And he, I, I think that he brought a level uh, to the music that they didn't bring in the Hurt Locker. I really enjoy his score for Zero Dark Thirty. It, it has this pulse to it that kind of drives it, and it really fits kind of this driving um, determination that Maya has and that, you know, these people have in finding bin Laden. I really enjoy his score. It's, it's definitely kind of a hard score to, um, to sit and listen to time and time again, but it is a great score. And uh, from a very busy man who did this rise of the guardians, Argo moonrise kingdom, rust and bone, uh, Clo Clo. He's done a lot of films this year. He's been a very busy composer. Uh, one of my favorites he did was 2007's golden compass. Uh, that's one that stuck with me. But he's of other movies that he's done, we've talked about uh, Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Uh, fantastic score. Uh, he's he's an amazing composer yeah. who, came, for me, came out of blue with, of all films, I think, it, what was the Bruce Willis film? Hostage? Was it Hostage that Bruce Willis yeah, did? Yeah, 2005 Hostage, right. Yeah, and that's the one that, that caught my attention. And uh, I, ever since then, I've been really enjoying his music. I mean, he did uh, a couple of the Harry Potter films, The King's Speech, The Tree of Life. Um, I, I just really enjoy his stuff. It's uh, it's not yeah. quite as listenable as something like John Williams. He doesn't quite get into the whole idea of the the themes and the melodies quite as much. But he has a very um, amazing ability to to put um, really strong music in films, and I I really enjoy his music he should he should totally keep doing that i think he, he may have found a career you know it, i if he keeps it up he just might uh, he, go somewhere he may it. really he may really go somewhere with that <laughs> uh yeah I, yeah you know this uh we, uh, this mark bowl fellow uh did you notice like he was like his his credit on this thing like he went from screenwriter and journalist to a mark bowl's production yeah, he's a uh, he. They're the partners. The whole Bigelow Bowl partnership is. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what comes of this next. I I, I don't know. I, I'm curious where they go from here. I've heard yeah. them say they want to do a prequel. A prequel to this. I also heard them say they want to do. What was the other thing that they said they wanted to do? It was completely not related to this, which actually uh, made it sound pretty interesting. And now I can't find it. Uh, I don't remember, yeah. it, but it was some. It was something completely, completely different. So. Well, and and you know, on that trend of completely different, uh, you know, wrap, this wraps up so far our Bigelow series, uh, and you know, I think it just ends on such a high note. Uh, you know, coming from Strange Days, which was a, a deeply dissatisfying low to the Hurt Locker, to this, uh, you know, she's, as we said last week, I, I get the impression that she is making films that that are deeply important to her and as such are, are you know, becoming increasingly important, important uh, you know, films to watch. Uh, and I'm, I'm very satisfied with this film. Yeah, I'm very satisfied with this film, The Hurt Locker, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing where Catherine Bigelow goes from here. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That yeah. that is all I that's all I have. What are we doing next? Do you want to talk uh, about it? Well, hold on. Oh, you, another another thing? No, we got to do our flick chart. Oh god. Oh, man, I totally spaced on that. Know, and we don't it? have budget. Uh, we're not going to talk any about budget or anything like that. Maybe we can review that later because it's well, so I, new. I, I do well, we don't know how much it's made, but I do see that it it cost about 40 million um with uh you know the rest of the budget it looks like it got to about 52.5 million so yeah. um cost wise that's about what i have but i have no idea you know it's it's making a little bit of money so far but it uh, like it, it just opened wide uh, as we're talking people are seeing right. it so um but yeah let's rank it okay go for it Ah, it's this is gonna be another unfair one. It's gonna probably shoot right up to the top. Zero Dark Thirty or Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. 
Well, I would say Zero Dark Thirty. Yeah. Hmm. Being John Malkovich. <laughs> I hate Flick Chart. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, see, this. 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 <laughs> are we ranking on on uh, what are we going to watch more often, or what is the better film? <sighs> see, I don't know. I honestly, I would probably, as much as I appreciate everything going on in Zero Dark Thirty, because it's a it's a masterpiece of a film. I already said. Yeah. But being John Malkovich will end up in my uh, my DVD player more frequently. I I think so too. I that's a, I, that's the film I find my I, you know I. I'm gonna. I talk about being John Malkovich on on a whole different set of merits. Yeah, but this is why Flick Chart. Yeah. Probably, although I am going to say we last week we put Hurt Locker at number four on the Flick Chart. Yeah. Zero Dark Thirty. <laughs> I would put above the Hurt Locker. Yes, I would too. But now we're putting it below being John Malkovich. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay all right do whatever what's next serious work to do with this flick chart what's uh, next adaptation zero dark 30 uh, uh, Shot really? of the dead. oh zero dark 30 <laughs> <laughs> although Shaun of the dead will definitely be watched more uh yeah. joe versus the volcano i can't say it out loud because it would break my heart <laughs> <laughs> it has to be zero dark 30. yeah uh, again, we're back to being John Malkovich. What we have to rank it again? Yeah. Why? Because it's it's gone the full cycle, and this is our last ranking. Oh. So are you so are you saying now it should be zero dark thirty? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's it's uh, it's I don't I don't know in the little flick chart world it's, yeah. it's to where it is. So we right. being John, John Malkovich. We stand by that. All right. So zero dark thirty is seventeen. That's a shame. Oh, see, we got some work we have some work to do. So, what we've been talking about, if any, uh, this is an ex- exceedingly long show, so uh, you know, may, I hope you're listening to it on triple speed. But the uh, what we're talking about is doing a a behind the scenes episode where Andy and I just sit and re rank all of our movies on Flickchart because we haven't really done that together, and that may be a, an epic six hour uh, episode. <laughs> 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 but we're we're committed to. Uh, to doing the work, whether or not we broadcast it is <laughs> is a whole different thing. So we'll see if that sticks. But these the re it will be re ranked is what we're saying, right? We're gonna re rank. Yes, 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 right. yes. Yes. Uh sometime yeah. before the end of February. If you are anxious to listen to that, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make right. sure if we don't post it we'll make sure you get a copy that's right that's right <laughs> all right uh that's good so next week we are so we're wrapping our our uh, Catherine bigelow uh and we are starting um gosh we're starting uh we're not starting we're continuing our our uh, john houston uh right we did we did one kind of with um uh the african queen yeah. is as a part of our um Jack Cardiff series last summer, right? And, and now we're going to be con- jumping, jumping back in and uh, getting back to some John Huston films. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, talk about a number of those, and uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, very much. We got a, we got a nice spread of Houston films. We do. Uh, it's it's going to be fun. It's going to be very fun. All right. Well, I'm excited about it. It's been a good talk, Andrew. Wonderful, sir. Thank you for chatting and. Uh, I guess we'll be touching base next week. Yeah. Catch you next week. We wanted to take a moment to thank you for your continued support over the years. It's hard to believe that we've been having weekly in-depth discussions about movies since 2011. That's right. 12 years and counting. Producing this show is a labor of love for us, but it does require a lot of time and effort each week. If you enjoy our podcast and would love to help keep it going, there are some easy ways you can show your support. One is by using our Originals page to shop for the original source material that movies we've discussed were based on. That's right. In season one alone, we covered 13 films adapted from books or plays, from Charlie Kaufman's adaptation to David Fincher adaptations like Fight Club. In season two, we covered even more, like Powell and Pressburger's The Red Shoes and The African Queen from our series about legendary cinematographer Jack Cardiff. We can't forget about the four Jason Bourne movies we talked about. Love those movies. Well, 
the original trilogy at least. <laughs> for our Richard D. Zanuck series, we did Jaws, Rush, Big Fish, and more. And for our horror series, we talked about John Carpenter's The Thing, which was adapted from Who Goes There? We did our first great car chase series with movies like Bullet, The French Connection, and Drive. And for the holidays, we did Preston Sturgis's Christmas in July. We had a great John Huston series with adaptations like The Maltese Falcon and The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And for our baseball series, Moneyball with Brad Pitt. Have I told you lately how much I love that movie? Oh uh, Yeah, I think you have. Plus, our Magician series and Heist film series had adaptations as well tons of page-to-screen gems. Listeners can find the details and links to the original material at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book, play, or movie you buy through our links helps support the show, and it's no extra cost to you. So dive in and get your next read today. Thenextreel.com slash originals has all the films adapted from other sources that not only we have covered, but all of the shows on the Next Real family of podcasts. Check it out and get reading. Support the show and build your reading list. It's a win-win. Head to thenextreel.com slash originals. 